Man, oh man, what is the world coming to you guys? I hope everyone is blessed, well, healthy, and that nothing but the best is going on in all you beautiful people's life, man. Just here to make sure you have an okay life. And I hope you guys' mental is okay, that you're just in a, a safe, good position right now. And that life isn't hitting you too hard. Because right now, a lot of people are, are struggling, man. Um, and this is why I say, you never know what somebody's going through. Spread that love, you guys. Spread that love. Uh, Americans, sound the alarm. We can't pay the rent. And shout out to Michael for this amazing video we're going to get into. But man, the economy, the prices, inflation, it is ridiculous. You know, um, I'm seeing local shops that have been open for years by my house shut down uh, family friends you know getting evicted having to sell properties um, even my subscribers on my other my family members on my other channel um, that send me emails almost every single day and most of those emails are heartbreaking people that are 40 years old having to find somewhere to stay with friends or even their own parents at 40 years old, you know? Uh, so I've read some very heartbreaking emails of people that just can't afford to live comfortably anymore. So please spread that love, man. I'm wishing pay raises, upgrades, salary increases, the opportunities of a lifetime to all you guys. And most importantly, more health. That you guys are healthy, that you're in a just a good, healthy position all around. Because it's, it's not looking good, for real. It is not looking good, you guys. But let's get into this video uh, by Michael. American sold, sound the alarm. We can't pay the rent. Let's see what he's talking about. A few days ago, we were talking about businesses and how 41% of businesses cannot pay the rent right now. That's obviously not a very good omen for where the economy is going especially if you saw that chart in the video i'll actually put it up one more time here so you guys can see just to check it out and again i've i've seen so many of my my childhood spots close down man it's ridiculous comment down below how has it been in your area you know but it is it, it's not looking good man we are going downhill at a very fast rate man very very fast rate Check up on your people. Check up on your friends, your family. Make sure they're okay, man. It's not looking good. It really isn't. Like, I went inside the grocery store the other day, and I just, I look at prices now from back then and just laugh. Like, what are we, what is going on? <laughs> what is going on? You know, people don't, don't even want to go, don't want to go to the dealership anymore. People are literally making uh, life decisions on which brand should they choose because it's a a couple dollar uh, it's a, a, a dollar difference even just a dollar difference a dollar difference mm. just how much the business delinquencies have been going up and the amount of people that cannot pay the rent well guess what now guys now it's time to talk about the average person the consumer and it turns out based on a recent uh, survey from Credit Karma, 25% of Americans right now cannot afford to pay the rent. That is pretty substantial. Now, that means 75% still can, so that's a good thing, but 25% of people that are saying they can't afford it right now is going to change the way the housing still market operates. Number. Because a lot of these people that can't afford to pay are on the younger side, surprise, surprise. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna look to pool together, they're gonna live with roommates, they're gonna move back in with their parents or grandparents or something like that. And what that will do is it will change the dynamics of the housing market and the demand for housing in general. And we can- yep. And the most people that are buying houses right now are people 50 years and older 50 years and older you guys um and like i say most kids that are coming back from college now these last uh these last two years um with masters um you name it you know they have degrees they finish school 
but they are coming to move back with mom and dad or even friends, you know, or, or close or loved ones because they just can't afford to live comfortably. Nobody wants to pay um, a mortgage payment on an apartment. Simple. So, you know, people are paying mortgage payments on these apartments now. And that's been talked about huge on a lot of my videos. So it's getting crazier. You can see that it's clearly the younger people that are getting hit by this because Gen Zers, 31% of them say that they already live with their parents and 27% of them say that they can't afford to pay rent. Even Gen Xers and baby boomers are saying that uh, they're compromising on necessities right now to be able to afford to pay their rent or their hmm. house payment. Now, well, another thing that people that can't afford the rent are doing right now besides moving back in with their parents is they're moving to more affordable areas of the country, which I think is actually the smartest thing to do. I mean, <laughs> it's fine to move back in with your parents if you're going to use that time wisely and save your money towards maybe buying a house. or Use that time wisely and save up. Hold on, you guys. I'm messing it up. But yeah, save up use, and use your time wisely. Again, we cannot get time back, you guys. It goes just like that. So use your time wisely. Or, you know, invest the difference. Do something with that extra time that you're going to spend at your parents' house. But if you really want to stay on your own and stay independent, a lot like I did when I was younger, I think it just makes more sense to move somewhere more affordable and continue making it on your own. Not only will you have a higher sense of pride and uh, accomplishment in your life, but also it might present some new and good opportunities for you. Maybe you will be able to afford to buy a house in an area like that. Maybe you're not going to feel so pressured with the cost of life in a more affordable city because everything doesn't cost a fortune. Who knows, maybe you'll even end up with a little extra money in your pocket left over every month after paying all the bills if you move to a cheaper area. So there can be a lot of benefits to doing something like that. But one of the most alarming parts of this uh, survey from Credit Karma is that 57% of Americans use the majority of their income on housing costs, which leaves little remaining balance of their budget for anything else so mm. that's clearly not sustainable guys like and that's once again one of the main arguments of why i don't think home prices or rents have any room to grow any higher because you know that's well over half of the people that are saying that they're already spending most of their income on just paying for a place to live Man. so whenever that number continues to rise it's going to have too much of a downside effect on all the rest of the economy in terms of people not having money to spend on doing any extracurricular activities, that's going to be too much of a downer on the economy. And I think it's naturally just going to correct itself. That's what I think will happen. You can't just have a, a working population working just to pay the rent or just to pay the mortgage and not buy other things, guys, because, you know, there's more to the economy than just real estate. All these other businesses need to be thriving as well for things to be balanced and be working well. And basically what's been happening is people have just been barely hanging on. You know, wage growth was what, 5%, maybe 5.5% throughout 2023, just barely beating inflation. But if you account for inflation, it's basically like no increase in income at all. And if you didn't get a wage increase in 2023, then you're essentially making less money because of inflation. The lucky ones who did get a wage increase and combined with that, along with the credit card spending, which we know has been completely out of control since it's at record high levels right now, People have been able to stay afloat financially, but that's probably not going to last much longer on this trajectory. You can even think of it like most people's households right now are operating similar to our government where they're spending more money than they bring in. But the difference is our government has the ability to print extra money when they need it at our expense and we have to deal with the consequences. But average households don't have that ability. The closest thing we have to printing money as consumers is credit cards. And as we can see, people are tapping into that because you're borrowing from tomorrow to pay for today. That's what credit card spending is when you don't pay off the bill every month. But people only have access to so much credit cards. People will yeah. not be able to continue credit card spending and borrowing from the future if they're not making their payments, guys. There's going to come to a point where credit card companies will stop lending to people if they're not paying their bills or their credit score is slipping too much. Now, speaking of people going into debt, 
I saw something today that is just unbelievable, guys. Nearly half of the people out there think that they will pass debt onto loved ones when they die. <laughs> so, first of all, why do we have to inherit debt? Like, why would it be my risk? And I just wanna put this out there. My dad just passed away not long ago. And um, of course he had debt, you know, credit cards and stuff. But we sent in the birth certificate. My mom sent in the birth certificate and they closed the accounts. Gone. Nada. That's it. Um, so yeah, death certificates. Yes, indeed. responsibility to pay for somebody else's debt or likewise for you like if somebody else runs up the tab and they die why on earth would it get passed down to you you're not the one that ran uh -huh. up the tab and first of all I'm not a lawyer I don't know much about this topic but I'm not really sure if somebody can legally be held responsible for somebody else's debt so 46 yeah. send in the death certificate yes indeed percent of Americans say they believe they'll pass their debt on to loved ones if they died today and that's according to a recent survey from and it's usually for for people that are married like if the wife loses the husband um, like like my mom she sent in the death certificates and all the debt was cleared you know because they were sending uh, notices in the mail and so it's usually for people that are, are married you know, but other than that, it, I believe it, it shouldn't be passed on to the kids or anything, anything else like that. It doesn't, I, don't, I believe it does not work that way. But again, if you, now if you're married, it's a different kind of type of deal. From Policy Genius. That was just at the beginning of this year in 2024. This is fresh information. Just since 2019, Americans have taken on an additional $2.9 trillion worth of household debt, which is staggering. And the average adult right now carries an excess of $22,000 in debt, excluding the mortgage, guys. So you're talking credit card debts, personal loans, different things like that, that people just don't pay off. Well, what we have here, folks, is either an attempt at another get rich quick scheme or somebody who needs to get out of this property because they can't afford it. They bought it back in August of 2022 for $4 million, and Ooh. now they have it listed for $4.385 million, but have had it listed since August of 2023 for almost $4.6. So they have lowered the price substantially while they're carrying a $65,000 a year property tax bill. Do they oh, need help? Man. Are they trying to get out? Are they trying to get rich quick? Because they're not gonna be making any money after the sale of this property once they pay all the closing costs and their realtor their hefty commission. Oh man. And out of those figures, the average person is carrying $6,000 in credit card debt right now. At 20, 25%, sometimes 30% interest rates, just look at the amount of interest you'd be paying each month. And you can quickly see how that can spiral out of control. Now, once again, this is something that plagues the younger generations because 17% uh, of millennials expect that if they were to die today, that their loved ones would inherit their debt. And only 7% of Gen Xers said that, and only 2% of baby boomers think that. So clearly, baby boomers are the clear winner when it comes to financials across the board, guys. They own the most real estate, they have the highest amount of net worth, they have the lowest amount of debt because they're basically the luckiest generation in history. Like you can just, you know, pat them on the back all you want and say, you know, they were smart or whatever, but it's just a confluence of being in the right place at the right time is what it is. Hmm. Baby boomers were able to live through arguably the best part of American history when our economy was essentially booming for many years. Wage growth was outpacing inflation by a pretty handsome amount. They were able to get good jobs with benefits and pension plans and all sorts of things that helped propel them into the future. But these are all things that we really don't have today. And I'm not sitting here trying to cry and complain about that. I am just stating the fact here that they had a massive leg up, whereas today's generation doesn't. And let's not forget about housing, right? Like they were able to buy houses in many cases for 60, 70 grand. And those houses now are worth six, seven hundred thousand dollars you know, literally yep. increasing in value tenfold throughout the time they've owned it. You know, oh, no other generation ton. in history has ever 
gotten that lucky. And like I said, that's just luck. If you bought a home and you're a baby boomer, you're probably rich by default. <laughs> Although the most troubling part of this survey to me is the fact that wealthier Americans are more worried about passing on debt than poor Americans. They, they talk to people who are earning $150,000 or more per year, and 58% of them said that they expect to pass on debt compared to 47% of those who don't earn as much. Now, Policy Genius, who, who conducted this survey, said that this is most likely due to the fact that people who earn more money get into more debt, and they have the ability to borrow more money, yep. and they're more worried about it because they have more debt sitting on their balance sheet that's being ready to pass down to the next generation. But you know, everything seems to have an agenda these days and it seems like the whole point of this story that I read is about people obtaining life insurance because they go on to say how you know a bunch of these people that are worried about passing on the debt don't have any life insurance. In fact, 21% of those who were surveyed who expect to pass on debt say that they don't have any and that's why people are worried about it. So basically what they want you to do is they want you to buy life insurance after reading this. You know, they want people to believe that they're covered and that somehow their loved ones are not gonna have to pay for any of their debts once they're gone. But that's probably a bunch of BS because we know how insurance is such a huge scam and they try to get out of paying for everything when it comes to uh, car insurance claims mm. and homeowners insurance claims. And I'd be willing to bet that life insurance claims are no different because what life insurance really is, is it's a way to invest, it's a way to uh, evade estate taxes. It's like a cash reserve that people can borrow from. I don't know much about life insurance, but I know they have different types of it. And there's ones that you can pull money out out of and things like this and so it's just another scam if you ask me guys but if anybody out there is an attorney especially like a family lawyer or somebody who knows about this stuff like when people die can they legally pass on debt to you like you know say your parents pass away and they have a bunch of credit card debt obviously if they have any liens against their house that'll probably take care of itself when the house is sold but when it comes to uh, unsecured personal debt, does the next generation who inherits that actually have any responsibility of paying it? If somebody out there knows this and you are in fact a lawyer, let us all know because I have no clue. Now when it mm. comes to real estate and the housing market in general, what I always see is that we're all living in this alternate reality, guys. Like literally you have people saying, I'm seeing nothing but low inventory and prices going up where I live. And then you have a bunch of other people saying that no, prices are down year over year. I'm seeing inventory explode and houses are now cheaper than they were a year ago. So obviously people's reality are gonna be different based on where you live. And this chart that just came out from uh, Freddie Mac, kind of gives us a huge insight into this. Like, check this out, guys. No wonder we're all living in this alternate reality because when you look at this list, this chart, almost every single place where real estate values are down is located in the western half of the US. According to this chart, I only saw a few places on here, like in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, Hammond, Louisiana, that's on the East Coast, and then Bangor and Lewiston, Maine are on this list of where prices are down, but everywhere else on this list is located in the western half of the US. And I remember covering a story like this earlier in 2023 that it's literally the tale of two housing markets right now where the western half of the country is sinking in most places and the eastern half is still thriving. You're still seeing prices go up. So I think it's just important for people to recognize this and understand that it really does matter where you live, guys. But overall, this is a good thing to see that there's this many markets across the country that are losing value right now is promising for people that have been waiting on the sidelines and hoping that they can become a homeowner one of these days. This is signs of progress right here because we were not seeing this a year ago, two years ago. Now earlier I kind of mentioned baby boomers and how they're basically the luckiest and wealthiest generation. Well here's a story that actually backed this up, okay? Because in the last decade we have seen the value of the U.S. housing market double. So in yeah. 10 years, home prices have literally doubled, which is something that we've never seen before happen ever in the history of this country, first of all. And baby boomers are the ones who benefited from this the most because they were the ones who owned the most real estate during this time frame. So like I said, 
being in the right place at the right time. But just look at how staggering these numbers are, guys. In 2012, the total value of the U.S. housing market was about $13 trillion. Well, now it's almost doubled to $24 trillion. And most of that appreciation came in the last few years. When you take a look at this chart, you guys can see it dipped back during the last housing crisis and then started to go back up. But then it really shot up during that gray line, which is the pandemic. Big surprise, right? We all know that. But here's why it has made baby boomers so rich. Because out of that $24 trillion worth of US real estate, baby boomers hold 18 trillion of it, guys. That is the lion's share. That is almost all of it. Now, I made a little error because actually the total value of the US housing market as of right now is $46.8 trillion. But what we were talking about earlier is the value of mortgaged homes across the US. So the total value of mortgaged homes is 24 trillion and baby boomers own 18 trillion of that. So still guys, it's, it's still a lot, right? But the biggest problem with this, it creates this massive shortfall in the entry level homes. You know, you have baby boomers buying those to downsize, right? You have big corporations like BlackRock and Blackstone and Open Door buying up the cheaper homes to rent out as investments. So, you know, the problem is, is all the cheapest homes that most young people would actually be able to afford are now owned by corporations or old people. Because yep. as a lot of you have pointed out on my <laughs> channel, like, well, Michael, yeah. we're seeing these huge price reductions on houses that are already expensive, but you don't see it that much on the lower end. And that's this is why, guys, because everybody wants a slice of that. Everybody wants to buy that $250,000 house, whether it's for an investment or to live in, because that's simply where the profit is to be made on the investment side of things, and that's where people can afford to live when you're talking about people's household income. So it makes sense from both perspectives of that's what people want to buy, that's what's helped us drive up the cost of housing so much. But one thing that young people need to remember from all of this is just because the baby boomers have all of the wealth right now doesn't mean it's gonna stay like that forever, guys. One day, they're not gonna need that house anymore for a variety of different reasons, okay? And someone's gonna get that house, whether it's through the house being sold or being inherited and then sold. Because literally 75% of the homes that are inherited through somebody that passes away get sold. They don't keep the house. Usually they just want the money. You know, when somebody inherits a house, they usually can't afford to keep the house, first of all, because they already have their own house to pay for. And then they're faced with, do I keep this house as a second home, try to swing both payments, or do I turn it into a rental property and do I want to be a landlord? And that's why most people say, you know what, let's just take the cash and run. It's going to be easier to do that. And then they'll upgrade their lifestyle and buy a nicer, bigger home for themselves or whatever. So really my point is that even though it might be frustrating right now, and things might not work in your favor right now as a young person, just understand that it's not gonna be like that forever. Because there's one thing about money, guys, is you can't take it with you when you're dead. So all yeah. that money will inevitably just go like down that. to the next generation in some form or another whether it's through inheritance, whether it's through being able to pick up a deal. But I think if you're a young person who's struggling to pay the rent, like we were talking about earlier, I think it's definitely smart to figure out ways to cut costs and move in with other people in order to circumvent that for now and better your future, guys. Because the last thing you wanna do is be constantly trying to play catch up, be constantly trying to spend all of your income just to remain on your own. You know. See, and I love that he said that. I love that he said that. Because, see, most people are not going to tell you that. Most people are like your, like your old uncle. You got to get out there and figure it out yourself. <laughs> nah, see, he said it perfectly. Perfectly, man. If you have the opportunity to save up and invest in yourself for the future and you have time to just be with you know a roommate or save money with your being at home with your parents take advantage and to not just sit around you know work hard manage your time wisely invest in yourself you might even have to take some, some uh, might even have to risk 
Take risk. Lose sleep. Yeah. Said it perfectly. Well, because I did this actually myself. When I first moved to Miami, I was only 20 years old, okay? And I was paying enormous rent, okay? Think about this. It was 2008. And just to stay in a bedroom, okay, I was sharing the place with a roommate. I had to pay $1,700 per month. And back then, that was a lot of money, okay? Oh, wow. It's still a lot of money today. But imagine how much it was in 2008 before we had this massive inflation, okay? So I had to pay $1,700 a month plus an extra $300 a month in utility costs because my roommate was insane and left the lights on all day long and wanted me to pay for the phone bill and the, the cable bill and half of all that stuff, right? So it quickly wow. added up, as you can imagine. So I had to come up with $2,000 a month as a 20-year-old that just moved to Miami, and that was just to pay the rent. That's none of my food or other living expenses, nothing. And you know what I decided to do? Because I was spending most of my money on rent, I ended up getting my own place that was far cheaper. I ended up renting a place for only $900 a month. So I was literally able to cut my rental payment more than in half and be living on my own on top of that and not have a roommate. Now today is kind of the opposite dynamic where you have to get a roommate in order to lower that cost or move back in with your parents. But it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't matter what you have to do. I think you should do it in order to better your financial future because that was probably one of the smartest things I ever did back then to start getting myself ahead, getting to a point where I can actually start saving some money. And if it wasn't for doing that, I might have not been able to make it as a young person here. I might have had to turn around and go back to Illinois and live in my parents' basement. And chances are, if that would have happened, you wouldn't be watching this video right now. So <laughs> if you guys enjoyed this video, yes, indeed, make sure man. you subscribe to the perfectly. channel. And if you don't want to wait for my next perfectly. video to come out, check out this one on the screen.